Congratulations for making it through the day. I know it's hot. And I'm not the last speaker. There's one more to come, so I'm his opening act. And I have the great pleasure today to be talking with you about property wrappers. So I'm going to shield my eyes. Who's using property wrappers? Night. Nice, nice. Okay, who hasn't even tried it yet? You are brave. So, Swift property wrappers are new to Swift 5. And like many of the very best core features, they are ones that create libraries of code that feel like they're part of the language, but are not actually part of the core language. Now, I have to figure out how to get to the next slide because they didn't give me the clicker. <laughs> so, what does it mean to have a feature that looks like it's part of the core language? but is in fact not part of the core language. And that's what this talk is mostly going to be about. Now, this looks like language, but not the language, is a hallmark of the Swift programming language. And on the whole, Swift prefers to keep its compiler very small, compact, dedicated, and on task. At the same time, it's introduced the standard library, which give us all sorts of features that look like they're extensions to the language, but in fact are written in Swift and are not part of the compiler. They're provided outside of it. So here's where we have audience participation, or at least we're going to try. Where else have we seen already things that look like language-like features, but are not part of the language? If you feel like it, just shout it out. Anybody? Don't worry, I'm going to give you the answer in a second. Or at least one of the answers, because there's more than one. OK. Things that extend types and capabilities, but there are other places that Swift creates opportunity to express itself as a language. So how about operators? So Swift allows you to build custom operators and they look like they're part of the core language. But in fact, you build them yourself. And here's an example right here. This does exponentiation. It takes a number, any number, and raises it to an integer number of times. And what you get is, as you hear, is raised to the second power, raised to the fourth power. And Daniel saw this, and he says, oh my gosh, Look at that code. That code is so adorable. So he made me make a slide where I actually put a circle around the code. You can look at it later. Well, where else does Swift do this? How about trailing closures? Trailing closures are another Swift language feature that create code that reads as if the language has been extended. But in fact, they're just syntactic sugar for function calls. And they make these calls look as if they're control structures, which they are not. Here I have something I wrote which extends integer. And it creates a for loop, basically, without an index. So in this example, I have an integer doing this scope five times. And the scope braces are important here because they're telling part of the code story. And you want your code to be expressive, and you want your code to be able to tell things in a way that's usually limited to language-provided features, but in Swift is not. And Here's all the code. I just extended int to repeat the task. And 
It's programmer created. You could put it into a library if you wanted to. I don't recommend it. It's not a particularly well-named loop, but it's simple and it's easy to do. Now, here's a more popular topic. How about Swift UI? What a lot of people don't realize is how much Swift UI has bought into the notion of language-like features. So here's some Swift UI code. And what I did is I circled state. And in Swift UI, you use state to allow a view to read, to monitor, and to manage this property's value. It's a source of truth for this view. And how many of you here, again, I'm going to do this thing, have tried to quick look the word state? Zero. Oh, one. Good for you. Well done. You can. And the reason you can is because state is not a keyword. It's not an attribute. It is something that looks like language but it is still not language. And if you take a look, I put a little arrow there, a little green arrow. And what you have is that state is a struct. And here's the quick help for it. Isn't that cool? I just love that. And it's built into the system for Swift UI using property wrappers, the subject of the talk. You see, I get there eventually. So, what we have here is between the state property wrapper, operators, trailing closures. These are all things that extend the core language, and they're all something that fits into the philosophy of Swift of keeping that compiler small and well-targeted. So, let me tell you a little bit about the history of property wrappers. Property wrappers started out as something called property behaviors, and they were introduced several years ago by Joe Groff of the Swift Core team. And the original push for creating this feature did not come from language. It came from trying to reduce redundancy in the compiler. There was a lot of redundant code. And specifically, things like lazy, the lazy keyword, or memoization, where you store um, already computed things so that you can make things more efficient. There, there was all this duplicate code. So property behaviors were going to allow um, this to move out of the compiler and into libraries, which is, you know, Great, we love that. This is one of the earliest Swift proposals. It's number 30. And right now, if you look at what's in review, we are in the late 270s. So it was the very first proposal that came to be that, in fact, was not rejected. It was not accepted. It was deferred. And it stayed deferred and deferred and deferred. And then suddenly, right at the time Swift UI came out, it, it got reproposed as number 258. And it was reissued in April of 2019. It was accepted in July. And it is now many parts of Combine and Swift UI. And what made this so special, at least for me, is that if you go and you look at that proposal, what you're going to find is not just the core team coming up with this feature. Instead, everybody who played with it started coming up with new ways of using this. This was ridiculously useful. And the, the proposal just grew. And it grew and it grew because everybody was finding ways to use them. And I wanted to show you some ways to create these amazing, new, and powerful, clever, and useful things with property wrappers. So here's one of my favorite things from the proposal. And this is a property wrapper that syncs with user defaults. Anytime you assign something to a property, it automatically syncs it with user defaults. Is that not cool? Now, obviously, you could create a property wrapper that would work with core data or um, Google Firebase or whatever. The point is 
that this all became possible with property wrappers as part of the language. And here is the complete 100% implementation for user default sync. Look how sweet that is. That is so cute and adorable and short. It, you just create this and then you can use the name of the structure or you could use an enum or a class, you're not limited to structs, as what's sort of like a pseudo keyword. I really love this. So if you see over here, we have that at sign followed by the name of the type. And this is how easy it is to customize the wrapper. So let me tell you about my first property wrapper. A couple of years ago, I was at a conference in Colorado Springs, which is right near where I live. And there was a developer named Andrew McKnight. And he did this survey of GitHub. And what he wanted to find out is which things were many people developing? Where was the overlap? When you were writing your own libraries, what were the bits that were missing? Now, I know there are at least a few people here who date back to the age of Objective-C. Here are my square brackets. And if you remember, the biggest thing that people would put into their own custom libraries back then was first, first for arrays, getting the first element. And eventually, Apple broke down and they put it in themselves, which is why everybody needed namespacing, but Swift's yeah. So, S Andrew did this massive search, did this massive thing, and he found out what was the most commonly implemented thing on GitHub, at least, but that represents a good proportion of all the developers. Common. What is the most common thing? And he found out that it was something that was string trimming. Everybody wants to trim strings. Get that white space away. It doesn't matter if you're taking input from the user. It doesn't matter if you're taking it from a URL or um, from any other source. We all want to trim the white space from you know, both sides. So some people use properties for this. Some people use methods for this. Some named it trim. Some named it trimmed string, but a vast number of Swift users wanted to have access to this at the very core level. And as our first approximation, we thought, well, maybe we can try to push it into the standard library. And that actually didn't get anywhere. It got sort of bike shedded into oblivion. People get very passionate when they start talking about very simple things. So how do we do this? Well, if we did it using a library approach as our first approximation was, you have the problem that you have to audit every single call. And that's point of use. There's going to be times you forget because of its point of use, but this is a behavioral contract. So surely there must be a better way to enforce this behavioral contract. It's hard to inspect, um, whether manually or automated. This is a difficult problem, but it's not intractable because there is a solution that we would have used a year ago. What you want to do is mandate your behavior contracts at the point of declaration, not the point of use. And what we would have done a year ago is just simply create property observers. And here's a property observer from code that would have run. And it does the string trimming. It ensures on all the signs it does what we want. So what's the problem? Why do we care about pushing this? And the answer is that if you were doing this 20 times on 20 properties, you'd have to cut and paste this code over and over and over. And that's just not good. And there, it's not reusable, it's not modular, and you don't want to create new string trimming types. But with property wrappers, 
You don't have to create a new type. You don't have to add a hundred property observers. What you can do is build a single property wrapper, which you can use over and over again, like here. And you don't have to audit at each point of use, and you don't blow up your types with massive and redundant property observers. So what you get is simple. It's readable. It's positioned in the right place. And it is really documentation friendly. I am not kidding. You can quick look these things. It's, it's beautiful. So where would you use this? Well, as of today, where places people are using property wrappers are for thread safety, to make sure that you know, read and write access is on the right thread. Uh, they're using it with barriers to ensure exclusive reads and writes. They're using it for uh, syncing with external stores and web. And by the way, you can do asynchronous calls as side effects with property wrappers, which is terrific. And there's just so much more you can do. These are just a few of the things I urge you to go and check out this technology because, you know, you get 18 minutes and we're at 140 here. <laughs> so, property wrappers. They are a powerful, reusable, library-friendly, amazing feature. And if you're not already using them, you will love them. That's a guarantee you get your money back from me otherwise. And I just want to thank all of you for sharing, <laughs> giving me this opportunity to share such a wonderful new Swift feature with you. And oh, there's my wrap-up slide. <laughs> so that's what property wrappers are. And I'm sorry, what? Oh. <laughs> anyway, that's what property wrappers are. And I think you will find that your, this ability to take property access, to be able to give it these wonderful behaviors, and then to be able to put them into your organization's library, or to share them through open source is just a wonderful step forward for the Swift language. And that's everything. Thank you.